So aqueous potassium chloride is added to aqueous silver nitrate. All right, and that forms silver chloride precipitate and aqueous potassium nitrate. So this one helped you out a little bit because they told you what was precipitate and what was aqueous. Um, that's something that you, may, that you will need to be able to do on your own um, for the exam. That is, to get these products and know that silver chloride will be your precipitate um, because it's not soluble. Is that reaction balanced? Yeah. It is, right. Okay. So now let's try, let's do the complete ionic equation. In a complete ionic equation, you write all the ions separately. So you've got K plus Cl minus silver plus NO3 minus. Those are all ions. You don't split up the silver chloride because that's not an aqueous solution of ions. That's a solid. And then you do split these up. Yeah? Uh, the first one is more chloride. That's the, or what's the name for the first one in the blue? Potassium chloride? No, what's no, the name of the... Oh, this would mean, this would be the molecular equation. Yeah. Complete ionic equation. So you've got molecular, complete ionic, and net ionic. So the net ionic, much like a net income when you subtract out the stuff that um, isn't extra, you cancel out what's on both sides. So in the net ionic, you, you'll notice, whoops, is that right? For the net ionic, you notice that potassium and nitrate exist on both sides of the equation, which means that they don't really participate in the reaction. They're the spectator ions. So the net ionic equation is just this. Let's see if you can do the same now for B. All right, so same deal. Aqueous potassium hydroxide, KOH, is mixed with aqueous iron 3 nitrate. To form a precipitate of iron 3 hydroxide, and aqueous potassium nitrate. All right, is that balanced? No. How do we balance it? All right, that looks good. Whoops, so this should be aqueous too. So as you've probably noticed with these, um, and this will be important coming up in the exam, you can't really do these problems without also knowing your ions and your naming. Because if you don't know the ions, you can't get things to balance right because you don't know how many of each counter ion there should be. And if you don't know the names of stuff, then, well, you don't know what to write down. So um, it's, it's kind of a compounded problem for you if you haven't gotten those names yet uh, when we get into the equation. So please get working on that. All right, now the net ionic or the complete ionic equation, uh, a question I was asked a bunch is, do you carry down all of these numbers? And the answer is yes. You want to know the total numbers of all the ions that are in the solution, um, even though some of them will cancel and it'll be a little bit redundant. So it should look something like this. 3K plus, and you can write those as all individually aqueous or not. I tend to don't because it's assumed. You can't have an ion on its own that's not in a solution. So that's fine. So we're going to split that up into three potassium ions and three hydroxide ions. And then we're going to split this one up into an iron 3 plus, or plus 3 if you prefer, and three nitrates. 
Why three nitrates? Because there were three nitrates in the ionic compound here. And then we have this solid product, iron hydroxide. And then once again, three potassium ions and three nitrate ions. So now the reason we had to bring down all those numbers is because we needed all three hydroxides to react with the iron to form the um, solid precipitate product. Uh, and if you just kind of always bring all uh, everything down to the, to the complete ionic equation, you'll always have enough and you don't have to worry about it. Why can NO3 stay in the very sheet that they three? Right, because what this is saying is you have three distinct nitrate ions per iron. So when they're split up, they're going to be three separate ions. What if you put it in that wrong? Yes, because that assumes when it's in a com that assumes it's in some sort of a compound. And what we're really saying is no, it's actually broken up in the solution and there are separate ions floating around. So that it's sort of like separate molecules of nitrate. All right, so then for the net ionic, we notice that the three potassiums are on both sides and the three nitrates are on both sides, which again, if you didn't bring down all those appropriate numbers, they might not all cancel and you might get confused there. And we're left then with three hydroxides and iron three and an iron hydroxide. And that's the net ionic equation. No, you can, doesn't matter. You can write it however you want. Um, in fact, like the way we wrote this, I just wrote it in the order that it was given. But say this is a question where it didn't give you the products. It just said these two things were mixed. What are the products? In those cases, just depending on what's going on in your head, you could, you'd switch them and write them down in either order. So it doesn't matter. All right. So let's look at another type of reaction now. And then we'll come back and, and have some practice on this. And then we have the next hour to kind of drill this down uh, even more. Acid-base reactions. So this is an experimental concern. Always add acid. What does that mean? Acid second. What? You pour acid into something else, right? Right. You always add acid, and specifically what this is talking about is to water. But water and acids actually make an incredibly violent, explosive, dangerous reaction. We don't usually think about that because we don't usually mix them in that way. Um, but if you have concentrated acid and you want to make less concentrated acid, which we'll be doing in lab, you add the acid to the water slowly, not the other way around. The reason is when you add water to acid, you basically have a small amount of water molecules and a lot of acid. So it can react very, very quickly. If you add a little bit of acid to the water, the acid quickly gets dispersed and you've effectively made a very dilute acid. Right? If you just put one drop of acid in water, you have a very, very dilute acid. But if you put one drop of water in acid, you have a very strong acid that now has a reactive water thing in it and can cause a huge problem. Um, so when diluting, this is always an issue. But where it's also an issue and when it causes the most problems is cleaning things. If you have some unused concentrated acid, you know, just a little bit in the bottom or whatever, your first instinct is often, I'm just going to run this under the water. Well, what are you doing? You're adding water to concentrated acid. And there's a chance that that's going to blow up in your face. So we always add acid to water. If you have some concentrated acid that you need to get rid of, what you do is you get a big thing of water, big beaker of water, and you slowly add the acid in. Um, and then you can dispose of that accordingly. Um, but that's the thing to always remember. You always add acid. Always add acid. Don't add stuff to acid. Add the acid. And the, the definition, there are three different acid-base definitions, Ar Arrhenius, Bronsted, Lowry, and Lewis. We're going to talk about them in some different ways. But the most important one for us now, and in a lot of cases in general, is this, what's called the Bronsted-Lowry definition, which just tells you that an acid is something that gives up H+, and a base is something that takes H+. It's a nice definition because it allows you to pick out in a reaction whether or not you have an acid. Um, and a base. Remember, the goal of this, problem-wise, is to be able to look at a reaction and say, 
this is going to be an acid-base reaction or a precipitation reaction or whatever, like you did on Thursday. So we need to know what acids and bases look like, like these, to be able to do that. Let's look at the acid column. So what do you see is a really common um, factor among all those acids? The H, right? Which is where that definition is useful. If it has an H, can give up that H, that's an acid. So we can see that as an acid, and that can be a clue that what we're looking at is an acid-base reaction. Remember, you might get these words in a, in a question. That would make it really easy, because it just says acid, right? But you might get the symbols. And you need to be able to recognize that HNO3 or H2SO4 or HI or whatever is actually an acid. Now, we've talked about that a little bit already with naming, so you should be OK. With bases, um, hydroxide is a good indication you've got a base. Hydroxides tend to be good bases. But there are other bases as well, um, things that can accept or produce OH minus in a different way. Like This is actually a table from a book, but it talks about how when you put ammonia in with water, the water actually acts as an acid, gives a hydrogen to ammonia, becoming ammonium, and you make hydroxide. So when you talk about a solution of ammonia in water, that's actually an ammonium hydroxide solution. It's the same thing. Um, so we'll see some reactions here, and you'll see wh where that comes in. This is something that you may have done. So you have basically two rea uh, a couple reactions going on. You dissolve the sodium hydroxide, you dissolve the acid, the hydrochloric acid. And so our molecular equation looks like this. NaOH plus HCl yields NaCl and H2O. What type of reaction is that in terms of like how the things are rearranging? Is it different from what we've been doing with the precipitations or is it the same? It's the same, right? The, I the cation from one side goes with the anion of the other side. And they switch, even though the H and HCl is not really a cation, it's a covalent compound. We, you, can, you can think about them as switching. The OH gets the H and becomes HOH or H2O, and then you've got NaCl. So what drives this reaction? Why is this not just, why, why, don't, they, uh, why don't the ions cancel out? How do we write this complete ionic equation? Let's start it. So the complete ionic equation here, since these are in water, are Na plus and OH minus, because that's aqueous, right? And then you've got H plus and Cl minus, because that's also aqueous. Then we've got Na plus and Cl minus here, also aqueous. And what about this H2O liquid? Does that split up into H plus and OH minus? It doesn't. That's now a covalent stable compound. So then what does the net ionic equation look like? Yep. OH minus plus H plus yields H2O. So the driving force, or the thing that makes these acid-base reactions happen, is the formation of water. So what's important for you to think about from this in terms of test questions? Well. When you see reactions like this that are forming water, there's a good chance that there's acid-base chemistry going on there. Yeah? Uh, sort of. Yeah, sort of. Um, I mean, water is neutral, yes, because it's the product of an acid and a base. Why it's actually that number, um, we'll talk about. Actually, we won't get into it this semester, but next semester, or we can talk about it later if you want. It actually comes from the fact that water in its, like H2O, can actually be thought of as H3O plus and OH minus. And there's a dissociation constant associated with that. We can get into it later if you want. Well, let's, let's talk about this. All right, so here's something that, that we'll get into a little bit later. But it's this, this issue 
between strong acids and weak acids. So what's we haven't talked, um, we'll, we'll get into this kind of in the next chapter, but what have you heard or what do you think of when you think of a strong acid versus a weak acid? What does that mean? A stronger acid has a lower pH. That's true. Uh, what about like in general? It melts things. What? It melts what melts things? Acid. Okay. But what's the difference between a strong acid or a weak acid? A weak acid is diluted. A weak acid is diluted? Okay. Anything else? What have you heard about these? It's actually, it's a confusing term. And the reason it's a confusing term is because of the stuff that you said. Um, strong acids and weak acids have to do with their dissociation in water. That means how much do they form ions in water. And in, a little, in the next set of notes, or a couple sets of notes, we're going to talk about strong and weak electrolyte solutions. But a strong base like KOH will completely become K plus and OH minus in water. A strong acid like HCl will completely become H plus and Cl minus in water, or almost completely. A weak acid like acetic acid only partially splits up. Only a tiny bit of it actually splits up in water. And that's the difference between a strong and weak acid. A strong acid or strong base completely dissociates. A weak acid or weak base does not completely dissociate. And it actually doesn't have anything to do with the um, concentration or dilution or the actual power of it to cause damage. Good example of that, HF, hydrofluoric acid, is a weak acid. It doesn't dissociate in water but it's one of the most dangerous acids, one of the most corrosives. That's the one that can like melt through a bunch of floors as you know, when you, if it gets on the floor, it can dissolve bones and um, you can't keep it in glass because it actually dissolves glass. So you have to use stainless steel or uh, plastic and it's actually a weak acid. So. so in terms of reactions though, weak acids and strong acids form the same reactions with bases because of that drive to form water. So the fact that a strong acid or a weak acid will combine with a base to form water means that, that you don't have to worry about that um, distinction in terms of reactions. A strong acid and a weak acid will react the same way with a base. A strong base and a weak base will react the same way with an acid. So all you have to do is identify them as acids and bases and that they form water and you don't need to worry about that strength. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. All right, last type of reaction we're going to talk about that you also did on Thursday, oxidation and reduction reactions. So these types of reactions, you'll be able to um, notice, or you'll be able to pick out, because why? How do you think you can tell an oxidation or reduction reaction from the other types that we've talked about? What? Any ideas? <laughs> Sorry. You're changing, you're actually changing the charges. So here's the example. Look at what happens in this reaction. Sodium, elemental sodium, and elemental chlorine become sodium chloride. Remember when we talked a little bit about charges, um, elements in there by themselves, an elemental compound always has a charge of zero. So like sodium by itself, its charge is zero. Chlorine in Cl2, its charge is also zero because there's only chlorine present. Anytime there's only one type of element in something, the charges are zero. So you go with sodium zero and chlorine zero, and then you have sodium chloride. What's the charge of sodium and sodium chloride? Right, and chloride is minus one. So they've changed their charge. And that's really the key to noticing that you have an oxidation or reduction reaction. The sodium has gone from zero to plus one, which means it's lost an electron. And the chlorine has gone from zero to minus one, which means it's gained an electron. If one thing loses an electron, one thing gains an electron, electron transfer, that's known as an oxidation reduction uh, reaction. This also happens um, with covalent compounds like this, 
But I don't want to get into that right now because we haven't gone through those rules. Right. If it changes that charge number, we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, in, in some cases, that's easy, like here. We know that sodium, the only ion it ever forms, is plus 1. We know that chlorine, the, the, well, that's not true, but mostly chloride is minus 1. We'll talk about some exceptions to that. Those are fairly easy to assign. If we go back down to here, these are not so easy to assign, right? It's not clear whether carbon should be plus or minus whatever here, or hydrogen should be plus or minus whatever. The only one that's really clear here is this one, which is, what is the charge on oxygen? Zero. Careful. Zero. By itself is zero. It's not an oxide ion. It's not in a compound. It's just oxygen by itself. And its <coughs> elemental state is zero. So we have to actually come up with some rules to, to figure this out. And so here are the assumptions that we use to figure out oxidation states uh, in these reactions. Now, I guess we should talk about one thing. Um, oxidation state is a little bit different from charge, although we sort of use them interchangeably. Does anybody know what the difference is or why that's a difference at all? Sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed this, but sometimes I've said charge and sometimes I've said oxidation state. And they basically mean the same thing. It's the little number that goes on top that tells, you know, plus or minus, whatever. But they're actually different. Um, anybody know why? Or what that is? Okay, so you can stop listening right now if you don't really care because I don't want to confuse you. But the difference is, because the fact is that they mean the same thing. It's a little charge up on top. A charge has a specific physical value. Right? A charge of something is how much it attracts. Uh, it's a type of, like, a, well, it's related to potential energy, how much it attracts the opposite charge, that kind of thing. So we talk about ions as having charges and that they attract other ions. But in a covalent molecule like methane, CH4, we can still talk about the electron accounting, that is, which one has more electrons, which one has fewer electrons. But they're not really charges because it's not an ion. It's a covalent compound. So oxidation state is, more, um, is a better term because it refers to how many electrons are gained or missing. But it doesn't necessarily apply to a real charge, which is on an ion. All right, so that's the difference. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. You can totally forget what I just said. Um, in fact, technically, we sometimes write the charge and the oxidation state differently. But uh, I, I think that's interchangeable. And I think most people use that interchangeably now. So I don't, I don't think that's an important distinction to make. But, but, th but this is kind of what I was talking about. An oxidation state is an imaginary number. It's like, where, how do we keep track of the electrons? Whereas a charge is like a real measurable thing. You can measure the charge on an ion. All right? So here are the, here are the assumptions we use. If it's a covalent bond between two identical atoms, the electrons are split evenly. For covalent bonds between two different atoms, the electrons go to the atom with a stronger attraction for the electrons. And um, in a case like water, that looks like this. We have water with, uh, or, or an oxygen hydrogen, right? So in this case, for the electron accounting, we count all of these electrons on oxygen, not on hydrogen. So we say that hydrogen is missing electron. Oxygen has extra electrons, and we assign water as having a hydrogen plus and an oxygen 2 minus. Two, two of these, yeah, yeah. So that they end up canceling out. Now remember, those aren't charges. Those are oxidation states, meaning it's just a way of keeping track of electrons. But how that's important is let's go back up to this reaction. If we now know, and we'll, we'll talk about the rules specifically for this, if we now know that hydrogen is plus and oxygen is 2 minus, we can identify this as an oxidation reduction reaction because we see that oxygen goes from an oxidation state of 0 to an oxidation state of 2 minus, which means it's gained electrons. OK, let's talk about how to do this systematically. So here are the rules um, for you can always assign oxidation states if you follow these rules. First one we've talked about. The oxidation state of an atom in a free element is 0. 
So whether that's just in, in uh, metal, like iron, that's got an oxidation state of zero. Could also be a molecular compound, but only consisting of a single element, like hydrogen gas. Oxidation state is zero, because there's only hydrogen there. The oxidation state of a monoatomic ion is equal to its charge. That's pretty straightforward, too. If you have iron 3 plus or plus 3, its oxidation state is 3. 3 plus, right? Same thing. OK. And then the sum of the oxidation states for all the atoms in a neutral molecule or formula unit is 0, in an ion equal to the charge of an ion. In other words, if you have water, the oxidation states of the atom, elements in there of the atoms all have to add up to zero. If you have, so, you, so in this case, you've got hydrogen plus and oxygen minus, two pluses, whoops, two minus, two pluses and two minus, those cancel out. If the ion, like nitrate, NO3 minus, the oxidation states have to add up to minus one because the overall charge is minus one. Okay, now we talk about the ranking of a little bit um, trickier ones. And in these, you always follow this order. So first, this rule applies. You first check this rule. Group 1A metals always have oxidation state of plus 1. Group 2A metals always have an oxidation state of plus 2. We've talked about those already, right? 1, 2. So what does that mean? Well, that means that those metals will always have those states. There aren't exceptions um, unless they're by themselves. And you can count on them being that way. So if they have that metal in them, it makes your job a little easier because you already know what that's going to be. OK, let's say our compound doesn't have those. How do we assign them? Well, we assign them in order, moving down this list. So you check for each of these elements in order. Does it have fluorine? If so, that fluorine must be minus 1. Then you check hydrogen. Does it have hydrogen? Then yet Yes, then it must be plus 1. Then you check oxygen. Then you check the halogens, then the next row of 6A, then the next row of 5A, in that order. Um, I like to kind of think about it just kind of in a row there. So it's like fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and then 7, 6, 5. And that gives you the best chance of assigning the correct oxidation state. The reason that's important and the, where this comes from is that it's much more common for something like fluorine to have a minus one charge than something underneath fluorine. So like chlorine, for instance, can have multiple charges, but only if it's in a compound with oxygen. So if you count the oxygen first, you'll still get this right. This sounds all abstract. Let's just do some. I think it'll be clearer. So here, let's assign some oxidation states. Let's say we want to figure out the oxidation states in CO2. So you start with the list. First, is it only one type of element? No, so they're not zero. Okay. Does it have a uh, group one or group two metal? No. So now we start going down the list. Does it have fluorine? Does it have hydrogen? Does it have oxygen? Yeah. Yes. So that oxygen gets assigned as minus two. And then what does the overall charge have to be? Zero. Zero. So what does that mean that carbon must be? Plus four. Because there are two oxygens, and it has to balance out those two oxygens. So carbon gets plus four, oxygen gets minus two. You see how that works? Let's try another one. SF6. So you ask yourself the same questions. Is there only one type of element? No. Group one or two metals? No. One or two. Yep, none of those. So then we start going down the list. Does it have fluorine? Yes. yes. So what does the fluorine get assigned as? Minus one, which means what is sulfur? Plus six. Yep. So you've got sulfur plus six, fluorine minus one. Those are the oxidations. OK, let's try another one. Nitrate ion. Same questions. Is it all the same type of element? No. Um, does it have group one or two metal? No. Fluorine? Hydrogen? Oxygen? Yes. 
And so the oxygen becomes oxygen minus 2. So then what does the nitrogen have to be? Plus Careful. Plus 5. Why plus 5? Because oh, it's, uh, it's nitrate. It's minus 1 overall. So you need nitrogen to be plus 5 so that you have 6 minus and 5 plus, and you have minus 1 overall. All right. There are a few examples that don't follow the rules. Let's not worry about that right now. You won't encounter those. But let's go back to our reaction that we talked about now. And let's assign all the oxidation states in this reaction. So in methane, that first molecule, let's ask those questions. Does it have, is it all with the same element? No. no. Does it have a metal or a one or two metal? No. no. Does it have fluorine? No. Hydrogen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what does the hydrogen become? Plus one. Plus one. Okay. So then what does the carbon have to be? Minus four. Because there's four hydrogens, they're each plus one, so carbon has to be minus four to balance it out. What about oxygen? Zero, right? Okay, now let's look at carbon dioxide. Does it, it doesn't have the same elements, right? So it's not zero. It doesn't have metal. So does it have fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen? Yes. And what is the oxygen? Minus two. So then what does uh, carbon have to be? Plus four. OK, what about water? Does it? Yeah, we've talked about this one already. So hydrogen is plus one. And oxygen is minus two. Right. But if you go down that list, it would be the same thing. It would work the same way. All right. Now, to recognize this as an oxidation reduction reaction, we recognize that the, some of these oxidation states have changed, right? Which, uh, which elements oxidation states have changed? Oxygen and carbon, and not hydrogen, right? So this tells us that this is a redox reaction. And we can more specifically talk about which things are oxidized and which things are reduced. Oxidation is an increase in oxidation state. It's lost electrons. Reduction is a gain of electrons, a decrease in oxidation state. There are a bunch of fun little ways you can remember that. I put one common old one in here, oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. That's one. I mean, you can find a bunch of them online. Um, some people find the most um, profane ones are easiest to remember, so you could try to find some of those. And this tells you then which atom, in this case, is being oxidized and which one is being reduced. Uh, so let's, before we do another one, let's look up in here. Is carbon being oxidized or reduced? That is, is it gaining electrons or losing electrons in the course of this reaction? It's losing electrons, right? It's going from minus 4, which is an excess of electrons, to plus 4, which is now too few electrons. So if it loses electrons, is that oxidation or reduction? Oxidation. Loss of electrons. Increase oxidation state. So we could say carbon is being oxidized, and then oxygen is being reduced. In an oxidation reduction reaction, or redox is how we call it for short, there's always a transfer of electrons. You can't ever just lose electrons or gain them from nowhere. So you always have at least two different things, one of which is gaining and one of which is losing electrons in the same amount. So in this case, you got sodium and chlorine becoming sodium chloride. Sodium is oxidized, lost an electron. Chlorine is reduced, gained an electron. Here's where it gets really confusing. A common term or common terms used are oxidizing agent and reducing agent. The oxidizing agent is not the thing that gets oxidized. It's the thing that oxidizes something else. So the oxidizing agent is actually the thing that gets reduced. And the reducing agent is the thing that gets oxidized. And I know that's confusing. But look at these definitions again. 
the oxidizing agent, the thing that does the oxidizing, is the thing that is not itself oxidized. Whereas the reducing agent is the thing that is, that is itself oxidized, not reduced. So if you see that word agent, it kind of means the opposite. The reason those words come about, or that that's important, is that we often think about those molecules in terms of what they do chemically. So like you want to know if a chemical is an oxidizing agent because that means that it can oxidize like your skin or things like that. Um, the oxidizers can be somewhat explosive um, it, it, depending on what they're mixed with. Reducing agents can be explosive depending on what they're mixed with. So um, like an oxidizing agent, for instance, wouldn't, wouldn't react with water but a reducing agent might. So that's why these terms are important. If you look at like the MSDS forms or safety forms, they'll often say things like oxidizing agent or reducing agent. So I'm sorry that those terms are confusing, but that's why they're there. And they are a little bit important. Which one? Uh, CL2, yes. So that becomes negative one. Okay, so we talked about that. Let's try one now. See if you can try this one on your own. When powdered aluminum metal is mixed with pulverized iodine crystals and a drop of water is added to help the reaction get started, so that's not considered in the reaction, that's a catalyst. The resulting reaction produces a great deal of energy, bursts into flames, purple smoke is produced. And here's the equation. For this reaction, identify the atoms that are oxidized and reduced and specify the oxidizing and reducing agents. Yeah. Now, and you're going to have to do this anyway uh, in the course of doing this problem. But also, let's talk about, let's have you um, say what the oxidation states are for each element at each point in this reaction. So find the oxidation states first. Then you should be able to answer those questions. And use the rules from the last couple pages to find the oxidation states. Look at some other ones. This is all the new, the, all the end of the new material. So what did you come up with for the oxidation states? Let's go right across. Aluminum on the left. What's the oxidation state? Zero. Zero. Great. Iodine. Zero. Yep. Aluminum and aluminum iodide. Plus three. Plus three. Plus three or three plus. And iodine? Minus one. Minus one. Good. So what is being oxidized? Aluminum. Aluminum. Right. What's being reduced? Iodine. iodine. And what's the oxidizing agent? The iodine. And what's the reducing agent? Aluminum. Great. So that's how these things work. All right. Let's do some. Um, actually, does anybody have a book? Any chance with them? Oh, sorry, we can do upstairs. It's not a big deal. Let's let's go into some of these questions. Um, well, the book is on. You just head up. Manganese metal reacted with oxygen gas to form manganese oxide. Write the chemical equation, including states. Two Mn plus two O two. Mn two O four. Two Mn two O four. So what is what are the states here? Plus four. States. Oh, states. Uh, solid. Solid. Gas. No. All right. So let's look at this. This is this is the the answer. Why is it M N two O four? Why isn't it Mn2O4? Well, let's look at that. Let's look at it. The product here is manganese oxide. So that means it's going to be manganese 4, right? And enough oxygen to balance that charge out. And so each oxide is what? Minus 2. So you need two of those to balance out the plus 4. So it's MnO2. I mean, Mn204 also balances, but if you, if you see yourself getting something like that as a product, 
just divide it by a common divisor until you have the lowest possible numbers. Okay. All right, so what type of reaction is this? What makes you think it's a redox? The charges change, right. How did you know that the charges change? I mean, we've just been talking about redox, but put, put your mind in like, here's just a random question. Well, it's because like the oxygen is by itself, and you know, whenever it by itself is zero, and when it combines with something, it's minus two. So. Right, exactly. So whenever you see individual elements by themselves, and then they become not by themselves, you're almost certain to have redox going on. Because if it's by itself, it's got to be zero. And then if it's not by itself, it really can't be zero. So if you see that, if you see those elements by themselves, there's a really big chance that this is a redox reaction. Right. Well, we're not done yet. So this is redox. So my next question then, I'm not going to write it down, but we'll just talk through it. What, um, what is the reducing agent? Which I will write it down. So think about that for a second. Why is manganese the reducing agent? Because it's oxidized, right? It loses its reaction, its electrons. It gives its electrons to the oxygen, so that makes it the reducing agent. All right. So yes, let's do another one. The subscripts are reducible and you always have to reduce them. That's why I was confused. That's why I said M N two O four. Like, do you always reduce it if, if the subscripts yes. can be divided into each other? Yes. <laughs> Mostly. I, I guess always is, is yeah, always in an ionic compound and not, and not in a covalent compound. That would be a good way to do it. OK, let's try another one. So this time, I'm going to ask you to draw the products and determine the type of reaction. So I'm going to say complete balance the equation above and give its type. So there, there are a couple correct answers. What I see most people having here is something like this, which is great. Water and calcium sulfate. And to balance that, we need no sulfate is minus two and calcium plus two. Yep. Now here's here are the issues here. This is a liquid. And actually, calcium sulfate is a precipitate. Um, so here's the other correct answer. Uh, when you, what type of reaction is this, by the way? Acid Mainly it's an acid base. It's also a precipitation, but the driving force is really the, the acid base reaction. You've got sulfuric acid, which is part B, and what's this one called? Calcium, calcium hydroxide, and what's this called? Water. Good, and this is calcium sulfate, right. All right, so you've basically got, you, you switch them and you've got an um, acid-base reaction. Now, the other correct answer is whenever you have an acid that actually has more than one hydrogen, they don't all necessarily have to go with the base. So the other possible products here are to form water and calcium hydrogen sulfate, which is H2SO4 minus, um, or calcium bisulfate. Minus one of the hydrogens, not minus both of the hydrogens. So in that case, you would balance it a little bit differently. Um, however, either way you do that is fine. Okay. 
Did you have any questions about that one? Was it easy to identify that as an acid-base reaction and to know that it formed water? Okay, good. All right, let's try another one. Is that not balanced, right? No, it's Because you have... Oh, just kidding. Just kidding. This, is, this one is balanced, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, wait. I don't want to... I'll try that one. Yes, we're going upstairs. Um, okay, let's look at this. Zinc metal is dropped into concentrated hydrochloric acid. So that part we can, we should be able to write fairly easily. Zinc solid is an aqueous HCl. Okay, it produces bubbles. What are what's a gas that can be produced from those reactants? There's actually two choices. One I didn't think about, but hydrogen and Chlorine. So let's look at both of them. So we could either make hydrogen gas or chlorine gas. All right. Uh, what then would be the other products if we make hydrogen gas? This will be zinc chloride. Two, right? Because zinc is always plus two. It's one of those weird exceptions. Zinc's always plus two. And silver is always plus one. And what about if we make chlorine gas? What's the likely product? Other product? Yeah, it's actually what we would call zinc hydride, uh, which actually doesn't really exist so much. Yes, yes. Well, we have to. We haven't balanced this yet, but yeah, right. Either way, no. And here's why. And maybe you've seen this. If you saw something like ZnH2, would that seem weird to you? Yeah. Or less likely than ZnCl2? Yeah. Why? Just would? Yeah. Well, we're used to chlorine forming minus one charges, right? That's like a common thing. We're not so used to hydrogen being minus one. Hydrogen can, in fact, be minus one. There is a hydride anion. But it's much less common than zinc chloride, and it's very reactive. So if, if this came up and you saw something like zinc hydride as a product, you might think, hmm, that might not be right. Usually, yeah, you can think about it that way, that that's usually the issue. So the better answer, and actually what does happen in this reaction is this. So what type of reaction is this? This is a redox reaction. What's, what is uh, being oxidized? Zinc is being oxidized. It's going from zinc zero to zinc plus two. And what's being reduced? Chlorine. Not chlorine. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is going from plus one in HCl to zero in H2. So it's gaining electrons. All right. All right, let's go upstairs. We'll keep, keep going on this.